Welcome to Connecting the Dots, Religious Freedom, Reproductive Rights, and Public Policy. Thank you all for coming and spending your evening with us. My name is Katie Ryder, and I am the National Program Director for Jews for a Secular Democracy, a pluralistic initiative of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. Tonight's program is part of our Jewish Women and Religious Freedom in Pittsburgh project, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the grant sponsors of this program, the Jewish Women's Foundation of Greater Pittsburgh. This grant was underwritten by JWF trustee Nancy Weissman. Thank you, Nancy. I hope you're on. In memory of her beloved mother-in-law, JWF trustee Jacqueline Wexler. Without their support, this project and this webinar could not have happened, so thank you. I also want to thank all the members of the Jewish Women and Religious Freedom in Pittsburgh Project Steering Committee, who are actively involved in developing and planning all the project's programming. And finally, I want to thank tonight's co-sponsors, Red Wine and Blue Pennsylvania and the National Council of Jewish Women Pittsburgh. We have an amazing panel for you tonight. Um, I'm very excited about it. We ask that all of you joining us, please stay muted during the program and use the chat function to ask questions. If you think of something while someone's talking, feel free to write it in the chat and we'll, we've will we got someone monitoring it and we'll try to get to it when all the panelists have finished. All right, let's get started. It is my genuine pleasure to introduce Judy Cohen, a member of the Pittsburgh Project Steering Committee who is going to introduce our panelists for this evening. Judy has been serving as the Executive Director of the Jewish Women's Foundation since 2003. JWF, through Collaborative Philanthropy, funds grants that affect positive social change for self-identified women and girls in both the Jewish and general communities. During her tenure as Executive Director, Ms. Cohen has helped grow the foundation from 32 original members to its current membership of 181, and has facilitated the foundation's grant making, which has invested nearly $2 million into the community. Throughout her career, Ms. Cohen has been committed to improving outcomes for women and girls. She helped found and served as co-chair of the Girls Coalition of Southern Pennsylvania and co-led the Jewish Domestic Abuse Task Force. She has been and currently is an active member of the National Council of Jewish Women Pittsburgh since 1988, and was president of the board from 2004 to 2006. Ms. Cohen is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University and lives in Pittsburgh with her son, Joshua. Welcome, Judy, and thank you for doing the introductions for us. Thank you so much, Katie, and good evening and welcome everyone. The Jewish Women's Foundation is really pleased to be a co-sponsor of this important program. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our panel. Let me start with Pittsburgh's own reproductive rights legal expert, the distinguished Professor Greer Donnelly. Professor Donnelly is a John E. Murray faculty scholar, associate dean for research and faculty development, and an associate professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh Law School. She is a national expert on abortion and the law. Professor Donnelly has been published widely in top legal journals and been quoted extensively in the media especially on topics related to medication abortion, interjurisdictional abortion conflicts, and the impact of abortion bans on other aspects of reproductive health care. Her co-authored paper, The New Abortion Battleground, was downloaded over 20,000 times, covered widely in the media, and cited by the Supreme Court's dissent in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Professor Donnelly's scholarship, advocacy, and teaching have been recognized through a variety of awards, including a Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award, Marion Young Award for Political Engagement, and Robert T. Harper Excellence in Teaching Award. In 2022, she was the 11th most downloaded law professor on SSRN, which is a platform used to share research and connect with scholars from around the world. Next up, joining Professor Donnelly is one of our wonderful local rabbis, Rabbi Emily Meyer. Rabbi Meyer is passionate about fostering belonging through understanding. She is the creator of Doodly Jew, a project designed to spark creativity and Hebrew learning. Rabbi Meyer was adorn, ad, ordained by the Reform Rabbinical Seminary, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in 2010, and holds an undergraduate degree in classics from Connecticut College. 
She lives in Pittsburgh with her partner, Rabbi Aaron Meyer, and their two children. Our third esteemed panelist is a renowned local expert on Judaism, gender, and abortion, Dr. Rachel Cranson. Dr. Cranson is a professor of religious studies and director of Jewish studies at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as a core member of the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program. She is the author of Ambivalent Embrace, Jewish Upward Mobility in Post-War America, and an editor of A Jewish Feminine Mystique, Jewish Women in Post-War America, a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award. Her writing on Jews, gender, and sexuality has appeared in top academic journals, as well as popular venues such as the Washington Post, Tikkun, and Lilith Magazine. Dr. Cranston's forthcoming book, Religious Misconceptions, focuses on the history of Jewish engagement in national debates over abortion. And finally, I'm very excited to introduce an extraordinary local organizer and Planned Parenthood storyteller, Allison Feldman. Allison has a master's in communication sciences and disorders and previously practiced speech language pathology in rural access hospitals, as well as for Pennsylvania's early intervention program. After returning to Pennsylvania with her husband and two young children, she has dedicated her time outside her roles at home as an active community member. She is currently serving as a regional and now national storyteller of Planned Parenthood in addition to working as a regional organizer and volunteer to several national nonprofit organizations. Her hope is through her personal journey and work to advocate for positive change and meaningful community engagement. So thank you all so much for joining our panel. We are so fortunate to have your expertise in our Pittsburgh community. And I'll now turn it back over to you, Katie. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate you doing the introductions. And I'm sure everyone will agree with me. This is an amazing panel. I'm just really excited to get started. Okay, so Allison, I would like to start with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that you have a very personal, honestly horrifying um, story of being pregnant and unable to prioritize. I don't know why. Just maybe choke up, unable to prioritize your own life. So I'd like to start with your story. Can you share what happened to you? Yes, thank you. And first of all, thank you to Katie and to Judy for those lovely introductions. And for all of the other panel members, talk about imposter syndrome, to sit amongst you women who are fighting so diligently for us and our community, I'm so grateful. And I wanna say thank you to everybody who logged on tonight. Um, you're seeking information and education and that gives over to empowerment. And when we are empowered as women, we lead to activism, engagement, and that's what's going to bring about change. So just logging on tonight is so impactful and giving us the safe space to have these conversations. We are really grateful to all of you for being here. So um, thank you again. And uh, my story is not uncommon. Um, and I am grateful that I have a platform that I'm able to share it. Um, to raise up the voices of the people who aren't with us now and the people who don't have the opportunity to speak about it. In 2017, so this is prior to um, the Roe v. Wade overturning, um, I had returned home from a three-month stint in Children's Hospital with my 21-month-old and my husband. Um, she had gotten a feeding tube um, placed at Children's Hospital here in Pittsburgh but we were living in a rural community um, in New York State, south of Buffalo. I knew how to work the feeding tube and no one else did. And I happened to be about 30 weeks pregnant. And it seemed like the best choice was to host Thanksgiving for our entire extended family at our home. So that's what I did. Um, that's what we do as women, right? Uh, so I got up early, I made Thanksgiving dinner, sat down about 4.30, and given my background in speech language pathology, as soon as I lost vision in my left eye and felt my face droop, my arm droop, my leg droop, and as I was hitting towards the floor, I announced to my family, I'm having a stroke, call 911. I knew what it meant to have a stroke um, from the bedside portion of that. I didn't know what it meant to have a stroke and be pregnant. 
Um, we had excellent volunteer first responders that showed up. Um, I knew them. <laughs> And they were so kind and tried to get me care at our local hospital, which was a point where anyone else who wasn't pregnant could have gone and gotten a shot to stop the stroke um, and been treated and triaged before being passed on to a larger hospital. Um, that wasn't an option for me. They refused my care because I was pregnant. And so then I was loaded into a, into a helicopter that I knew my insurance wasn't going to pay for. And because of the changes in the winds coming off of Lake Erie, instead of going to Hammett Hospital in Pittsburgh, which is a fully functioning hospital, I was sent to Buffalo General Hospital that didn't have any OBGYN um, on staff because that was the stroke and vascular um, hospital in the area. While in flight, I was asked one time and one time only between that November 24th and February 6th, when I finally delivered my child, um, who the priority patient was. And I chose me. And then I got ignored for weeks and months and days as that choice became clear that it was not mine. When I got off that helicopter and was rushed through the emergency room, I was offered a blood test and a CT scan but nothing else. I had doctor after doctor after resident after attending stand over me and tell me there's nothing they can do to treat me or to determine what the cause of the stroke was until I get that baby out. Um, I was given a large dose of heparin, heparin to take home, and was sent home 24 hours later um, with a prescription to see or a referral to see the high risk obstetrician in Buffalo, which happened to be affiliated with the Catholic hospital, um, Sisters of Mercy, so I was not shown mercy over the next several months. Um, I went to that first appointment at 30 weeks with a viable fetus, expecting to deliver, and I was told, no, your baby's growing well, your baby's healthy, you should keep your baby in you for as long as possible. And I kept saying no, I need to get back to my life. I need to not have another stroke. I need to get care. My baby will be fine. And my baby's at home and needs me. That went on from November 24th until my birthday on January 28th, when I decided I wasn't going to put up with this anymore and started having my husband drive me to emergency rooms where I begged to be delivered. I was still ignored. No one delivered me. No one would come up with a plan. I spent my days calling different neurologists in the area. Finally found one in Rochester, which was almost three hours from my home, who wasn't willing to see me until after I delivered, but was willing to help put together a care plan for that delivery. Um, I gave that number over to my high-risk OBGYN. And after begging eight times to be delivered, I finally showed up to the hospital on February 6th, where their plan was to put me under general anesthesia, which I was told would kill me by the neurologist or cause another stroke. I found out they had never even called the neurologist to come up with a game plan. Their plan was to deliver the baby safely and do that in the safest method for the baby. After my husband got very heated and angry because they listened to him and not me, um, they did decide to deliver me via C-section, but because they had not stopped my heparin, they pierced my dura lining not once, not twice, not three, but four times. My skull filled with cerebral spinal fluid. I had what I believed at that time was a TIA, and they delivered my baby, and I spent the next three and a half weeks of my life falling into a depression that I can't even really put into words. I couldn't go further than a 40 degrees or it would feel like my eyes were bursting out of my head. And finally, at that point, I was safe enough to finally get medica medical attention from a neurologist in Rochester. And luckily, I'm alive. But that was the landscape in 2017 when we had these protections. And those protections are falling away one by one by one. I'm an educated woman who knew what was happening to me. I'm a white woman who knew what was happening to me and I couldn't get help. So I'm lucky because of how I was born and where I was born. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of women who have 
very similar stories to mine that haven't been that lucky and that that depression led to other things. This isn't fair, it isn't right. And you guys just being here tonight and giving me the space to talk about it is going to help change this. So thank you for giving me the safe space. Thank you for listening to me. And I am happy after we listen to all the panelists if you have any other questions. Thank you. Allison, thank you so much. Um, I think we all need a breath. <laughs> and I've heard your story before, so. So I think, Rabbi, I would like to go to you next then. Um, I, Allison's story was harrowing. Her life, her health, um, her wishes ignored, her bodily autonomy violated. In my mind, her religious freedom was violated. Um, do you agree? Uh, can you speak to the importance of religious freedom to the Jewish community, what Judaism says about abortion and how this all relates to Allison's story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Allison, ugh, my heart breaks for you. Uh, I wanna offer some traditional words from Jewish tradition um, for one who has survived a harrowing experience. We say, May the one who has bestowed goodness upon you bestow every goodness upon you forever. And yet these words feel incomplete. You were not treated with goodness, with care, or with respect. Of course we want goodness for you. And we know that thoughts and prayers alone will not bring us the change that we want to see, that we need to see. You should, and everyone should, have the right to care for your body because it is your body. But it's also your religious right. Uh, so as many of you, as many of you know, midot are the values that guide Jewish life. They go hand in hand with the mitzvot, the commandments of Jewish life. Among these midot of our tradition is shmirat haguf, guarding or caring for one's body. The laws of our country that fully allow us to express our religious belief should ideally permit us to be able to fill, fulfill this value, to care for our own bodies through medical autonomy and without fear of repercussion. The obligation of Shmirat Haguf guarding one's body is rooted in sacred text. In Torah, we read, guard yourself and guard your soul very carefully. This is in Deuteronomy. This text becomes the proof text for philosophers throughout the ages who hold up the health and the safety of every individual as a core tenant of Jewish life. The Jewish philosopher Philo wrote, the body is the soul's house. Therefore, shouldn't we take care of our house so it doesn't fall into ruin? Maimonides, the great scholar who also happened to be a physician, wrote, when keeping the body in health and vigor, one walks in the way of God. It is a person's duty to avoid whatever is injurious to the body. So to live in a way that honors this religious obligation requires doctors to be able to give their best medical opinion and for patients to be able to be, make fully informed choices about the options for care and act on those choices. Anything less than that violates our right to live our religious doctrine. There's also a spiritual component to health. While there are distinct Hebrew words for body and soul, Torah and prayers often choose the interchangeable word nefesh, which refers to a person's physical form and their soul and the breath which bridges the divide. Judaism sees our bodies as gifts from God, which must be tended to with the utmost care. In the Psalms we read, I praise you for I am awesomely made. When we are not allowed to care for our bodies, we are also denied the opportunity to care for our souls. But this, of course, is more than just the, more than just the right to care for our own bodies and receive the best medical care available. The United States Supreme Court seems to be using one set of religious beliefs over the religious beliefs of others to inform their de decisions about reproductive rights. In the past decade, American conservatives seem to have weaponized the concept of religious liberty to promote a very narrow perspective. Religious people like me and others here value reproductive choice. Religious people want access to abortion. Religious people want women to have agency over their bodies. Religious people want to have their religious values of health and safety and honor and respect and love. And this should not be the backbone of our country's laws just because these 
just as those voices who say the opposite of their deep, deeply reliable of their deeply held religious views should not determine the laws of our country. I want to say that again because I got my tongue twisted. Our religious views should not be the backbone of our laws, just as the others should not either. We should each have the opportunity to live our own religious values within those laws. I want to highlight the work of the National Council for Jewish Women, NCJW, who are wonderful leaders work every day to ensure that every single person can make their own moral and faith-informed decisions about their body and health and future. I have, they have some fantastic resources to look at if you want to learn more about Judaism's understanding of reproductive rights. And I want to share a bit now, paraphrased from their materials, and also encourage you to visit their website to learn more. Like all good debates in the world, Jewish tradition includes a variety of responses to the question of abortion. However, there are some common threads to highlight. First, Jewish tradition holds that life does not begin until birth, unless you want to honor the old joke that life begins at graduation from medical law or rabbinical school. The Talmud considers an embryo to be like a bodily fluid up until 40 days of gestation. In Jewish law, a fetus is likened to a person's limb in regards to damages if paid if injured. And as I mentioned before, breath is a key component of life in Jewish tradition. So we learn that a fetus is not viewed as separate from the parent's body until birth begins. And the first breath of oxygen into the lungs allows for the soul to enter the body. Jewish texts, including modern Jewish legal rulings, maintain that the life of the gestational carrier supersedes the potential life of the fetus in matters of physical health and mental health. According to Jewish law, a person's health and well-being should not be jeopardized by pregnancy. Again, these religious beliefs should not be the proof texts for the laws of our country, but the right for rabbis to offer this counsel to congregants and the right of Jews to use these values to inform medical choice seems to me what, it's, what it means to truly have religious freedom. Thank you so much, Rabbi. That was, that was uh, wonderful. Um, I think I want to go to you near, next, uh, Professor Donnelly. I want to weave in the legal aspects of religious freedom and abortion. And I'm very grateful to have you here. So can you briefly, and I know briefly is a difficult word for this question, but can you briefly explain the legal notion and history of religious freedom in the United States and then using uh, reproductive rights and abortion as an example, how is the violation of the principle of religious freedom being used to discriminate and limit uh, our choices. Great, so hi everyone. Um, thank you so much um, to Katie and others for organizing this event. And um, you know, Allison, hearing your story was very moving. So thank you for your bravery and sharing it. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very high level overview of some of the um, First Amendment um, challenges to abortion bans that you've probably read about in the news, um, many of which are being led by Jewish run organizations. Um, and then talk a little bit about some of the legal strategy issues that are um, that we should be thinking about, I think, as a as a movement, especially um, as a Jewish movement. Um, and then I'm going to really leave to Rachel to talk about or to talk about all of the history of um, this movement, which I know she is very, um, very knows a lot about. Um, so as we have just heard um, from Rabbi Emily, the, we know that under Jewish law, the fetus is not a person, right? We also know that under Jewish law, abortion is permissible and maybe even mandatory to save the woman's pregnant patient's um, life or health, um, including their mental health. So to the extent an abortion ban pro, um, prohibits abortion, uh, when a Jewish law would say that it's required or at least permissible, um, then the question really becomes whether or not it violates the First Amendment, right? So many of you know that ever since Dobbs overturned Roe versus Wade a little bit uh, less than two years ago now, we have roughly a third of the country that has banned abortion. In many of those states, um, at least six, you have uh, states that do, need, do not even have a health exception um, to save the pregnant patient's health. They only have a life exception. So that's one of the Supreme Court cases. This term is, is kind of questioning that um, related to a federal law called Imtala. Happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, but just to give you a, a sense of the landscape now, we have a ton of states in this country that are banning abortion from almost the earliest moments of um, conception or a few at six weeks. Um, and some of them don't even have health exceptions, right? So, um, uh, so to the extent that you have Jewish law 
where we, which we just learned about saying that, um, it, that abortion is not only permissible, but mandatory in some cases to save the pregnant patient's health. And that includes her mental health. Um, then you start, start to wonder if there's a conflict here, right? So um, when we think about the first amendment and religious uh, freedom, there's two different types of first amendment claims that you might think about. The first that you hear often about is free exercise. This is kind of, if you're paraphrasing, a way of saying that the state can't stop you from practicing your religion, right? So if the abortion ban lacks a, an exception for someone who has a religious need to have an abortion, then the question becomes whether or not the state is prohibiting someone from exercising their religion. Um, so you might think, well, you have um, a rape exception to abortion ban, you have a life exception to an abortion ban, there should be a religious exception to an abortion ban. Someone should be able to say, this ban violates my faith, getting an abortion is mandatory under Jewish law for me, um, and therefore I need to be able to access it. So that's one way to kind of conceive of a, a, of a First Amendment challenge to a state's abortion ban. Another is through the Establishment Clause. This is kind of the inverse of that right, which says the state can't force the practice of a religion onto you, right? So the very question here is whether or not the bans themselves constitute the state practicing religion by essentially um, adopting the Christian concept of life at conception, right? So if we as Jews don't think life starts until birth, how can the state say under our laws, life starts at conception? Is that a religious idea that is baked into the very concept of the ban itself in a way that you can cha challenge it on the establishment clause? A lot of these um, new litigations, these new cases that you hear about are also involving um, what was is a federal law, but it's also there's these state corollaries known as RIFRA, Religious Freedom and Restoration Acts. These are where states have passed laws that prohibit the government um, from burdening religious exercise unless it meets a very high standard known as strict scrutiny. Right. So this is just another way. Right. So, so far, we've been talking about the federal constitution or the state constitutions under the First Amendment, religious freedom. But there's also statutory grounds potentially to challenge these laws because the states have said you can the state itself cannot prohibit the exercise of religion. You know, interestingly, and one of the reasons I like these cases so much is because it's really trying to use all of the stuff that the, the conservative movement has been doing over the past few decades against them. Right. Um, and so in some ways, the RIFRA is, is, is exactly that, right? So since Dobbs, you've probably read in the news that there's been a, a suite of, um, of challenges to abortion bans on religious freedom grounds in at least a half a dozen states, including Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, Missouri, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, and so, you know, at a high level, um, it's, uh, I, I, I think these are really important um, creative litigation strategies, right? So you may have read that the uh, Roberts Court, the current Supreme Court led by Justice Roberts, which is of course one of the most conservative Supreme Courts we've had in a long time, has greatly expanded the religious liberty rights, right? That's one of the biggest changes that the court has made thus far in the last few years. It has uh, mandated religious exceptions to vaccination. It has mandated re religious exceptions to civil rights laws, allowing religious people to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, for instance. Um, so, you know, the, the creative hook here, the interesting hook about this strategy is to take advantage of this shift, right? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, so even if this issue, and Rachel, I'm sure is going to talk about this, has been litigated at least a little bit before, um, the question is whether or not the right has, the religious freedom right, has expanded enough in the last decade um, that perhaps this has, there's a new, um, there's a new reason to be hopeful that there could be some success in this strategy. It's also interesting, you might have heard in the kind of the, the Roe era, people used to always talk about the anti-abortion movement chipping away the right, uh, chipping away abortion rights. In some sense, our own movement, those who care about reproductive justice are in the opposite position, almost trying to chip away at abortion bans, however we can, right? So we might be doing what the Center for Reproductive Rights is doing and going after to expand health exceptions through the Zerwaski and related litigations. Maybe we're trying to get religious exceptions. Maybe we're trying to get Imtala, right? There's all these ways in which we're trying to kind of add add a little bit in, at the margins in the hopes that we can try to improve the system that we're in um, with the goal that one day we can hope we can really be restoring the right um, more holistically. Um, but I want to make the argument that really I think more important than this litigation itself 
this um, uh, in terms of like expanding the rights here. Uh, I think this litigation serves a really important um, goal in changing the narrative. For far too long, the Christian right has tried to gain um, a monopoly on not only religion, but also morality in this country. People have abortions every day for good and moral reasons. They do so because not only because um, they think they're making the right choice for themselves, but because they often think they're making the right choice for them, their families. Um, I love to say this statistic every time I give talks, the majority of people who have abortions are already parents. And the number one reason people seek abortion is because they do not have the financial funds to support a child, right? So when we think about the reasons people have abortions, um, we need to remember and center the fact that they are good and moral reasons. Um, it's critical now more than ever to have a counter narrative to the one of the Christian right, uh, which is to suggest that um, only good and selfless mothers would um, uh, would carry, they would have to carry pregnancies to term, right? We have to do our job and proving that religious people, people of faith and people of uh, morals um, support abortion rights. Um, so with that said, that's, those are my like, this is the great thing about these cases coming out. I, I do want to um, give a few caveats about things that worry me a little bit. One, um, people have talked about the re religious exceptions, right? Um, so there's a question in these cases about what's the remedy? Is the remedy that we want abortion bans to have an exception for Jews? Um, that is problematic, right? It would probably be a religious exception, a ge general religious exception. Um, obviously, the devil's in the details and how that is effectuated. Um, do we really want a situation in which someone has to prove their faith or get a, a rabbi or a faith leader to sign off on their abortion? Um, obviously, if we had something as simple as the as the religious exceptions for vaccine mandates, we might not care so much. They're just self attestation. Um, so how that was would be effectuated is important. Um, in the litigation, some of these cases are arguing that any exception at all would create an unconstitutional entanglement with the state and religion, and therefore the bans need to be completely and totally struck from the books. Right? You can't have an abortion ban uh, because it will interfere with religion and their there's no way to kind of have an exception. I think that's going to be a tough argument to make with this court. And so we're left with kind of, well, what is this exception going to look like? Um, another caveat is that you're already starting to see big questions about whose faith is sincere. Um, so in one of the most uh, far along of these litigations in Indiana, you saw amicus briefs being filed um, saying the non-Orthodox Jews don't follow Jewish law anyway, and therefore their faith is not sincere, their religious beliefs don't matter. In other words, they're basically saying that Reformed Jews are hypocrites when they quote the Talmud in litigation because they don't follow it for the Sabbath. Um, so this is a very important conservative move, right? This is a way for conservatives to say, we're going to use Jews for our conservative goals, but not for our, uh, not, but not allow the progressive um, Jews to have the same say, right? So you, if you followed any of the religious liberty stuff in COVID, um, Orthodox Jews were a big part of that story. Um, and so um, I think the conservative legal movement wants to save um, Orthodox Jews to be used um, how they want, but they don't like this idea of liberal Jews um, getting in on the action there. Um, and most importantly, I want to just, this is my last caveat, I'll just note that you know, sometimes I think it's important for us to, as much as this is a creative and interesting legal strategy, um, you know, Judaism might not be as progressive, you know, the, the Talmud might not be as progressive as we want it to be, right? Um, it's important to remember that um, in the Talmud, it's uh, at least my understanding, and I defer to others who know this law better than me, um, but it's not like we're talking about, um, you know, a completely and total free carte blanche to have abortion when you want one. And for the most part, my understanding is that it's justification based. In other words, it's something like, yes, abortion is wrong wrong except, right? Or it's justified when. Um, and that might not be the framing that we as a movement really want for it. Um, so for some of you on this on this call, it will be. For others, it's not going to go so far, right? So we, we might be worried about um, quoting a patriarchal old uh, text um, in a modern time when that's not actually how we view reproductive autonomy. It's not as if um, the Jews from from millennia ago or centuries ago, I don't know how old it is, um, were um, uh, really saw uh, um, uh, reproductive autonomy in the way we do now. So we have to be very um, careful in, in how um, 
uh, aggressive uh, we want to use the Talmud and, and religious texts in particular. So I'll stop there. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Donnelly. I already have so many questions. And we have one more amazing panelist. Our final panelist is Dr. Rachel Cranson, who was on another webinar for us last year. And we are thrilled to have you back, Dr. Cranson. I know you have a book coming out soon on the history of Jewish engagement on the debate around abortion. So you are our expert here. Do you all do you also believe that religious freedom and reproductive rights are interconnected? And if so, in what ways have Jewish people engaged historically in the fight for religious freedom and reproductive rights? And why should people know about this history and care? Why does the history matter? Okay, let me first kind of get to that history and then we'll, we'll we can talk a little bit about why it's important and, and why it matters. Um, before we start, let me just thank um, Greer once again for that really important overview, um, for reminding us that moral people have abortions. Um, thank you, Rabbi, for reminding us that Jewish people have abortions with the support of um, of liberal Judaism, the way that we practice it today. Um, and Allison, thank you so much for gifting us with your story um, and for telling your story um, to all the people that need to learn from it. Okay, I am gonna share my screen, which is, I think is, will just make everything a little bit clearer. Okay. Are we on, um, we're on slideshow, everyone can see that in, in a way that makes sense, perfect. So first I just wanna kind of review what Greer was talking about with, with the First Amendment because we kind of need to really have this First Amendment thing down to understand how um, American Jews have been engaging with it uh, in terms of reproductive rights for the past, um, for the past half century. So um, many of you may know that American Jews have a long history of engagement with the First Amendment. Um, and again, just to uh, reiterate what it, what it was that uh, Greer has already explained, there are, um, there are two mechanisms, the Establishment Clause, which guarantees that um, American law can't prefer one religion over another. And then second, there's the Free Exercise Clause, which blocks any law that would make it impossible or difficult for American citizens to, pre to freely practice their religion. And in the middle of the 20th century, and in, particularly, uh, and in particular from the 1940s to the 1960s, the lawyers who represented American Jewish organizations were some of the strongest advocates for a very strict interpretation of the Establishment Clause. And these lawyers um, advocated for really like a very strict, almost absolute separation between church and state. And they argued that American Jews would fare best in a nation that was entirely secular and that was free of religious influence. And this was a somewhat odd position for American Jews to take since um, American Jews at the time generally thought of themselves as a religious group. So on some level, advocating for a strict separation of church and state would seem to undermine Jews' own ability to influence public policy as religious citizens of the United States. But Jewish lawyers adopted this strategy, and by Jewish lawyers, I mean the lawyers who were representing American Jewish civil rights organizations. Um, and they adopted this strategy because they were very aware of their lack of power in relation to the Christian majority. And they understood that in American law, um, religion most often meant Christianity. And so they believed that any religious influence in American law would result not in kind of shared power or religious pluralism, but rather in coercive forms of Christianity. And of course, they often witnessed this coercion in practice. Um, for instance, when Jewish children in American public schools were required to say the Lord's Prayer, um, when they were required to participate in Christmas pageants, etc. So the lawyers of the American Jewish Congress were at the forefront of fighting for the separation between, um, between church and state and their legal arm, which was called the, um, 
which was called the Commission on Law and Social Action, was founded and led by um, Leo Pfeffer, um, who was a First Amendment expert who successfully litigated many establishment clauses in the middle of the 20th century, you know, um, cases referring to prayer in public schools, to state aid, to parochial schools, to religious symbols on public property, and, and many other cases. Um, so Pfeffer, just to give you a sense of how influential he was, he um, was influential in making it illegal for U.S. courtrooms to hang crosses on their walls, which used to happen, um, for making it illegal for public schools to force students to say the Lord's Prayer, and many other cases on um, pertaining to this issue. So not surprisingly, right, knowing this background, when Pfeffer and the American Jewish Congress first decided that they were going to step in and try to protect access to abortion, they approached it as a, uh, as a church and state issue, as an, and they saw it through the lens of the Establishment Clause, because that was their expertise. That's how they tended to see most issues that they got involved in. And um, in 1976, Congress was debating um, the first Hyde Amendment, which prevented public health healthcare programs like Medicaid from funding abortions. Um, and when the House of Representatives was debating this amendment, they consulted with Leo Pfeffer, who insisted that the Hyde Amendment should be unconstitutional because it violated the Establishment Clause by embedding Christian ideas about life beginning at conception into American law. Now, as we know, the Hyde Amendment passed in spite of Pfeffer's objections, but this question of whether the amendment violated the separation of church and state was hotly debated um, in American discourse and in the press, particularly once the Supreme Court decided to test the viability of these Hyde Amendments in the Harris versus McRae case, which happened in 1980. And um, anti-abortion activists from the Christian right pointed out that American laws often aligned with religious principles, like laws preventing murder and theft, which were also part of the Ten Commandments. So these Christian right activists feared that if the court decided that the Hyde Amendment was unconstitutional and on the grounds that it established um, Christian ideas into American law, that that would undermine the ability of any religious Americans to ever wield influence in the public sphere. And this concern, actually gave some communal Jewish leaders pause because even those who were really strong, strongly in favor of legal abortion, they wondered what impact Harris McRae, the Harris McRae decision might have on the ability of American Jews to advocate for their own interests as religious Americans. And some specifically wondered whether, you know, to give one instance, whether USA to Israel could be declared unconstitutional based on this strict interpretation of the Establishment Clause. So they shifted strategies. And in 1980, um, the American Jewish Congress basically brought this question of whether abortion restrictions violated the Establishment Clause to their Commission on Law and Social Action. And I'll just say as a historian that um, the brilliance of this commission in 1980 was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. It was made up of some of the most remarkable legal minds of the 20th century. Um, among those who considered this question were family court judge um, Nanette Dembit, civil liberties lawyer Harriet Pollack, um, Harriet Pilpel, who was a renowned civil rights lawyer, um, kind of uh, the architect in Griswold of um, thinking about reproductive rights as a as as a privacy issue. And then, of course, none other, other than the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who then was a um, professor at Columbia Law School and could go down um, downtown to the offices of the American Jewish Congress whenever she wanted to have these kinds of conversations. Um, Looking through these records was just like such a rare treat for me as a historian. Ginsburg's role in this discussion was particularly fascinating. She didn't take a position. She just kind of spent her time ripping away and you know, tearing away at everybody else's arguments to make sure that they were um, that they were thinking of every possible angle. Um, but, you know, Harriet Popel did make an argument and her argument was that the American Jewish Congress didn't need to run the risk of litigating for abor abortion rights through the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment because, first of all, they didn't have to because this was the era of Roe. Um, why think about 
abortion through the First Amendment when Roe was still protecting um, abortion abortion access through through other amendments. But she said the, that the American Jewish Congress should um, throw their weight behind the implied right to privacy found in the 14th Amendment, which was how, how the Supreme Court, um, to make it, to simplify it, was arguing Roe in the first place. And of course, it makes sense that Harriet Popel would have argued this because one of her many claims to fame is that she was one of the architects of the successful legal strategy that used the 14th Amendment to, um, to get, um, to, to um, secure a right for contraception in the United States. So she was basically saying, you know, this is what the American Jewish Congress should do. It's like, step away from, from the First Amendment. We don't, it's it's risky, we don't need it, right? Um, they didn't quite listen to her. Um, what ended up happening was that between 1979 and 1980, most American Jewish organizations, including the American Jewish Congress, decided, um, that they would no longer argue against abortion restrictions through the establishment clause. Like they would no longer use that argument that um, abortion restrictions violated the establishment clause. And um, and then, you know, that following June, the Supreme Court opinion in Harris versus McRae basically explicitly rejected the idea that abortion restrictions violated the establishment clause. So the lawyers representing um, Jewish organizations at the time basically decided, OK, this argument is dead in the water. Where do we go next? Um, so what they did was that in 1989, um, the Supreme Court was testing yet another set of abortion restrictions in Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. And um, the lawyers of the American Jewish Congress, and this was in coalition with other liberal religious groups, they developed a different argument for abortion access that was based not on the establishment clause of the First Amendment, but rather on the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, which we talked about before. Um, the clause that guarantees that American law will not prevent American citizens from freely practicing their religion. Right. So it's not establishment. It's not saying that you can't embed religion into American law. It's not freedom from religion. It's freedom of religion. It's freedom to freely practice the way that you need to. Um, and they worked with Harvard law professor Martha Minow, and they submitted an amicus brief arguing that abortion restrictions prevented Jews and other religious American citizens from turning to their own religious conscience when considering whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. And here I kind of want to get back to what um, Greer was saying about, okay, if we're, you know, that in these current cases where we're saying like, oh, people could have a, or, you know, are we arguing for only Jews to have a religious exemption for, to have an abortion? Should, um, you know, a panel of judges decide that they're, that they're, uh, beliefs are sincere enough. What they were arguing in this amicus brief was much broader than that. They were really kind of combining Harriet Popel's idea of privacy with religious exemptions, saying that the First Amendment guarantees that every human being has a religious conscience, that that religious conscience is a private thing. It belongs only to them. And that they are the only ones who can decide whether their religious, ethical, moral um, compass demands them to seek abortion care at any particular moment. So that she would, they were not seeking for, they, they were not seeking these kind of very limited religious exemptions. They were seeking kind of a broad acknowledgement that people have, people seeking abortion care have the right to their own, um, to their own uh, moral agency. Okay, so the Supreme Court justices in 89 didn't address this free exercise challenge during the Webster case. This happens all the time. They don't always address every single amicus brief. Um, to this day, the Supreme Court never explicitly addressed the idea of whether religious exemptions can be made to guarantee access to abortion. So this is this is happening on the state level in, in the Dobbs era. This isn't happening on the, um, on the Supreme Court level and, it, and it historically it never has. Um, so the First Amendment approach, just to kind of take a step back here, ended up being something of a dead end during the era of Roe, but it did represent a real change in terms of Jewish political strategy. 
Um, so for decades, the lawyers representing American Jews argued that their interests as a religious minority depended on the separation of church and state and a secular public sphere free of any religious influence. Um, in leverage on the abortion issue, they insisted that American law ought to accommodate Jewish and religious traditions that permitted or even compelled abortion. Um, and they started to lean into this uh, free exercise clause of the First Amendment and began to insist on their rights as religious citizens. So this kind of says a lot about the ways that American Jews were thinking about um, their position in American society, which we can certainly talk about more. Dr. So now we find ourselves at a very different. Yeah. I'm going to jump in and kind of try to, because um, I'd like to get, leave a few minutes left for. Oh, of course, minutes. I am. No, no, no. This is so interesting. I didn't want to stop. I'm you. ending. I am. I am <laughs> wrapping up. Wrapping up. Okay. Um. So yeah. Um. Basically, you know, right now we're in a really um different political moment. The le the legal landscape looks really different than it did in the late 20th century, and so in this um post row moment, this religious freedom free exercise argument for abortion that was developed by American Jews back in the 1980s is actually like gaining a certain amount of traction in the States as, um, as Greer has Greer talked about. And one question that keeps coming up is why are American Jewish plaintiffs kind of at the forefront of these arguments? And one, I mean, there are many reasons for this, but one reason for this is because of this history, is because of this long history that Jews have been engaging in the First Amendment um, in this way of already having this background of thinking about abortion rights in these terms. So I will I will end it there. I hope I answered the question about why why this history matters. Um, and let's please go on and and continue the conversation. Wow. No, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Can you um, stop sharing? Yes, of course. Back? Although I love this quote very much. All right. So we might I hope you guys don't mind if we go a few minutes over because I just know there's questions and I have so many questions. I'm going to start with one question that I really think is important right now, um, especially because this this webinar is part of the Jewish Women and Religious Freedom in Pittsburgh project. So I want to know why Jewish people in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania and other states where abortion is legal and generally accepted. I mean, Allison's story was pre-Dobbs. Why should people be concerned about their reproductive rights? And I'm just going to open the floor to anyone on the panel who, who would like to address that. Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. So I, I will say, um, you know, the fact that Allison's story happened pre-Dobbs and in New York State is not surprising to me. Um, and many people are not always aware of the fact that but even before Dobbs, most blue states banned abortion at 24 weeks. That's still true. Um, and so many states have interpreted that ban of abortion at 24 weeks to essentially be enshrining personhood at that point in time, making it hard, very hard for people um, after viabil fetal viability to get the care that they need. Um, so, uh, it's something that often surprises people. Um, and when people discover devastating fetal anomalies after that point in time, they are often forced to travel to one of the handfuls of, um, of states that allow abortion after viability, um, too, even if they live in New York. Um, why should we care? We're in Pennsylvania, right? We feel confident given that um, we have our liberal governor right now. Uh, well, uh, there's a, I would say the most important thing to think about is the 2024 election. If Tr Donald Trump wins, uh, we are all really screwed. Um, many of you may have heard the word Comstock before. If you haven't, I'm going to tell you about it and freak you out. And I hope you remember and tell everybody in your, your social networks. Um, Anthony Comstock was an anti-vice crusader who passed um, what anti-abortion movement now is claiming was a national abortion ban in 1873 before women had the right to vote. Um, it was never revoked and never taken off the books. It stopped being enforced in the 1930s um, and was presumed unconstitutional during the Roe era. Um, the Heritage Foundation is arguing that it is still good law and all it need, all they need is Donald Trump to be in office to start enforcing it on day one. Um, they think it is a national abortion ban um, ready to go. 
Um, so that would ban abortion nationwide, including in our home state of Pennsylvania and your daughters and your sisters and yourselves and your mothers or whoever um, will not be able to go to another state to get the care that they need. Um, if you happen to be following all of the horrors coming out of Texas and other states, um, being pregnant, which is already one of the most dangerous things for a young woman to be in this country, will become devastatingly more dangerous. Um, so we should care because we are not safe, right? We are. We know after Dobbs, no one is safe, um, and uh, we need to. We need to really appreciate that in this moment. Maybe you're muted. I'm muted. Oh my gosh. Okay. I want to put out one other question a, a little bit broader about what other issues, because we spoke a lot about reproductive rights and religious freedom, and that was primarily what this is about tonight, but do you feel there are other issues interwoven with our concept of religious freedom? Do any of you want to address that, that at some point I think we'll, we'll be talking about in this project? I think that um, Christian nationalism is involved in this conversation, the rights of LGBTQA plus, um, anyone who's considered not a, I guess I'm gonna be bold, <laughs> a white male of Christian belief, is it harm and at risk? If we don't fall into the mold, we're gonna be kicked out of the kitchen. Um, just even to also caveat on that, um, the contraception uh, bans that are coming our way. If I get pregnant again, I die. Um, I, I have not hit menopause. I'm 41. I have a lot more years where I could become pregnant. So this control that is being put upon us and forced upon us and our basic human decencies are taken away. Um, we have to stand up. We have to engage now. There, the time is a ticking, and we're we're in the fourth quarter, I guess, if we want to throw a sports analogy into it. So I think that um, lifting each other up and gathering each other under the tent is really important right now, um, because it's not a fight we can do individually. So bringing in other marginalized groups to the folds and standing together is going to be what's going to get us through this. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm going to ask I one more. Add, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll just Go jump ahead. in very quickly to say that that's um, another reason that um, this conversation is, is important because we're building that coalition of all of the people that are, um, that are and will be and need to continue to be um, working together from disparate communities, um, religious, non-religious, um, of various various races, very you know, to work together on this issue because it affects all of us. So understanding the way that it affects um, religious rights or, or and religious freedom in, in particular is kind of is important to have in mind as we build that coalition. Um, somehow we got a shared screen. Can whoever shared their screen unshare their screen, please? Or Paul, can you not allow that anymore? I want to ask. Um, I saw one one comment in the chat, which I would like you guys to address. I thought that was interesting. Um, Dr. Cranson and Greer and uh, Professor Donnelly, you, uh, someone said you spoke of Judaism mandating abortion. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, very, very briefly, since we're basically at the end of our time, but can you kind of uh, address that comment or one of you address that comment? I mean, I defer to, to, to Emily, but Rachel, you might know, I, I can just tell you what rabbis have told me. Um, Rabbi, I'll refer, I'll defer to you as well, although if you would prefer, I. No, I mean, I, I think that we, we were probably working from the same information, right? So in the cases where the, the parent's life is in jeopardy, that the parent's life is considered more than the, the fetus's life as it is not a life in Jewish tradition, right? So as if if you have a limb on your body that is 
that is in need of amputation, you amputate that limb. Same thing in terms of abortion, right? The life of the of the parent is more important than the potential life of a fetus. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a quick question about current cases uh, addressed to to either uh, to anyone really here, but there's a question in the chat about is there anything the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court can do to mitigate the impending uh, Mifepristone decision, which I hear is going to be this week, possibly, and future Comstock issues. Does anyone want to uh, address that? So unfortunately, there's nothing the Pennsylvania Supreme Court can do. So we have had a, a wonderful win in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Many of you probably read about it, um, which is really laying the groundwork for us to have our own constitutional right to abortion within the Pennsylvania Constitution, which is fantastic. Um, but federal law does trump state law. So if we have a bad um, ruling on the Mifepristone case um, coming out of the Supreme Court, uh, which could, for instance, um, uh, force the FDA to uh, reimpose what's known as the in-person dispensing requirement, forcing patients to pick up abortion pills at clinics, making them much harder to access, um, then that would essentially trump anything in the state, right? So um, the FDA has the ability to make it harder to access abortion pills because they have the authority to regulate drugs um, and their regulations are gonna trump state law. Um, same with the Comstock Act. So if you have a federal law that the Supreme Court deems is good, um, that technically bans shipping of pills through the interstate commerce, um, then that would trump um, state law. So um, unfortunately, uh, with both of those things, I, I actually am optimistic for the record that we're going to get a win out of the Mifepristone case, that it's going to be kicked on standing grounds. Um, and hopefully Comstock will never be an issue because Biden will win. Um, but if those things don't happen, then yeah, we're in, we're in trouble. We are 501c3, so we're not saying who should or shouldn't vote for anyone. We're just, we're just talking about policy here. Um, I, it, we're, we're really at the end of our time, but I want to just go around and give each of you 30 seconds to, to, to say one or two actions you think people who are still here, which is most of the people can do to advocate for religious freedom and reproductive rights. Um, maybe starting with you, Professor Cranson. Um, first of all, I would say um, there's so many angles to get at this with. I would say find, and, and again, I feel like it's meant to overwhelm us all with all of the assaults on our reproductive and um, and religious freedom. I would say find the one area that you are interested in, make sure that you know exactly what's going on and use that um, to lead you to action. Find out which group is, um, or which set of groups are working on that particular aspect of it. I mean, certainly with um, with American American Jews and religious freedom, it's it's NCJ, NCJW, as um, Robert Meyer said, who's who's at the forefront of it. But again, there are many other um, organizations who are working on various aspects of it. Um, I feel like if you know, if all of us are on one aspect of it and work with the organizations that are um, that are on top of that. Uh, will be able to put pressure on this issue as as a whole, I hope. Wonderful. Thank you. Allison, you want to 20, 30 seconds at most? Yeah, I think that you've done the big first step. You came here and you got informed. And now you have to do something with that knowledge. And um, I'm hoping that you're activated and um, that you vote. Uh, we have 27,000 people uh, in Allegheny County, women who have not voted since 2016. So you are educated, um, take your education, encourage others to vote, get involved in making sure people have the right and the ability to vote in November and contact your local organizations because we need all hands on deck, whether it's door knocking, phone calls, text messages, conversations with neighbors, uh, driving people to polls, um, just get involved. You took a big first step if you could dedicate this amount of time. You do that once a week from now until November, we're gonna make a big difference. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Meyer? 
So back in the year 2000, uh, Rabbi Ron Klotz and musician Dan Nichols wrote a blessing that I sort of want to bring to light right now. Um, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shenatan Lanu Chizdamnut Litakein Et HaOlam. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has given us the opportunity to mend the world. We live in a broken world. Uh, when we acknowledge this, we know that we have the imperative to not stand idly by to uh to to pursue justice to work for the the hope of of repairing that world and uh, we can be grateful for the opportunity because it brings this kind of group together and it brings us together and it helps us learn from one another and it encourages us to move forward and to act thank you so much rabbi and professor donnelly um, so other than voting, I would say storytelling, actually. Mm. Uh, what Allison did today, that's what changes hearts and minds. Many of us have, you know, 25% of American women have a, had an abortion. I have, right? We can all tell our stories. Um, the way that we change hearts and minds is by telling them and by, you know, there's no good good reason to have an abortion or a bad reason to have an abortion, right? Mo everyone who has an abortion does it because they think it's the best thing for them, their, their health, their families. Um, explaining those things, explaining it to people is how you move the needle. So um, sharing your, your families, the stories that you're hearing in the news with people in your life, that's how we change hearts and minds. And that's part of the fight that matters right now. Thank you so much. And I want to make a little plug for Jews for a Secular Democracy, because that is what we do. We fight for religious freedom and all these issues and try to put them all together and break down those silos, connect the dots, so to speak, as we, as the topic of this was. I want to thank all our amazing panelists, Allison Feldman, Professor Greer Donnelly, Dr. Rachel Cranson, and Rabbi Emily Meyer, and Judy Cohen for providing introductions and her support. I want to tell those of you who live in Pittsburgh that we will be following up with you with some potentially exciting ways to use this webinar to have little uh, smaller discussions with your friends and communities congregations. So look for an email from us soon. I want to thank our grant sponsors, the Jewish Women's Foundation of Greater Pittsburgh. As mentioned, this grant was underwritten by JWF trustee Nancy Weissman in memory of her beloved mother-in-law, JWF trustee Jacqueline Wexler. That is one thing you can do is speak with your money and get programming and education and advocacy out there. Thank you, Nancy. Lastly, we've got more events coming up. If you don't already, please follow us on Facebook. Keep your eyes posted for our emails and good night. And thank you again to panelists. You were just absolutely amazing. Thank you all for coming. Good night, everyone.